God in three persons, yet still mysteriously one. Think no doctrine stretches the mind more than the Trinity. You ready to talk about it? Welcome to MarsCast, a podcast from Mid-America Reform Seminary, where our faculty members address all things theological and cultural from a Reformed lens. I'm your host, Jared Luchavor. In today's episode, Dr. J. Mark Beach looks once again at John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, this time examining his writing on the biblical doctrine of the Trinity. While the natural world around us gives glimpses of God's eternal power and divine nature, Scripture provides the clearest, most complete revelation of who He truly is, revealing God's attributes like His boundless mercy, perfect righteousness, and endless goodness toward us as our Maker and Provider. But the Scriptures don't just tell us about God's qualities, they untangle the complexity of His very being and lead us to the truth that God eternally exists as one being in three co-equal, co-eternal persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Here's Dr. Beach talking a little bit more about John Calvin's Institutes. In our journey through Calvin's Institutes, uh, we're seeking to get something of a brief, very brief synopsis of what he says and what he seeks to Show us, teach us, after all, institutes really means instructions and uh, instruction in the Christian religion, if you will. And here with chapter 10, Calvin transitions. uh, Chapter 10, he's taking up the true God now, having already discussed uh, sacred scripture, divine revelation. He transitions from uh, the necessity of Scripture to its function, and its function, naturally, is to reveal God to us and to reveal God as our Creator and Redeemer. And Calvin, at this particular point, wants to focus in on the first part of that, God the Father as our Creator and our knowledge of Him accordingly as derived from Scripture given to us this way. So he briefly explores who God is and his attributes in uh, the chapters that start with Book 1, Chapter 10. And he offers a summary statement. He says, We've taught that the knowledge of God, otherwise quite clearly set forth in the system of the universe and in all creatures, is nonetheless more intimately and also more vividly revealed in his word. Certainly so. And so, as you turn to Scripture and what it teaches us about this huge topic of God, uh, Calvin says a sort of index can be found in the biblical testimony about God. He knows that we're going to talk about his attributes as one way to know knowing God, but if you've ever... uh, had any familiarity with how he treats this particular topic, it's rather slender compared to other uh, books that treat systematic theology or uh, basic instruction in the Christian faith. One passage he hangs out on is Exodus 34, 6 through 7, where it says, "...the Lord, the Lord, a merciful and gracious God, patient and of much compassion and true." who keepeth mercy for thousands, who taketh away iniquity and transgressions, in whose presence the innocent will not be innocent, who visiteth the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children. You say, well, that's an odd passage to fixate on. But he notes that you learn from that passage many things about God. You get his covenant name, that is, uh, Yahweh, Yahweh, Uh, you're merciful and a gracious God, you're the God who's Elohim, uh, the God of might and power, you're the God who, as the covenant God, has definition from himself, self-existence from all eternity, and then these other things that shine through his kindness, his goodness, his mercy, his justice, his judgment, his truth, 
Uh, Calvin turns also to Psalm 145, kind of doing the same thing. Again, rather than spend and have an extended analysis of God's institute attributes, excuse me, uh, Calvin hangs out just briefly on a couple of passages that are uh, that that exhibit multiple uh, perfections or attributes of God. Psalm uh, one forty five, likewise serving that purpose. Another text is Jeremiah nine twenty four. Let him who glories glory in this that he knows that I am the Lord who exercises mercy, judgment, and justice. And then using those three concepts as descriptive of God, mercy, judgment, justice, he shows how this plays out in human life in multiple ways, the way God engages us uh, in each of these ways, exercising also his power, his goodness, his holiness as he exhibits himself this way. So in a very short chapter 10, Calvin uh, teaches us something about God as the God who has multiple attributes, but again, he doesn't spend a lot of time on that. In the next chapter in book one of the Institutes, chapter 11, he asks, is it unlawful to attribute a visible form to God? And generally, whoever sets up idols uh, revolts against the true God. I think I read that as a question. It is unlawful to attribute a visible form to God, and generally whoever sets up idols revolts against the true God. Now he turns to polemics. So Calvin treats his doctrine of God proper here against idolatry, and he spends quite a bit of time exploring the evils of making images and uh, idols out of God to depict God goes to numerous passages that would take us too far afield to explore. But he does want us to see, rather than talk about God in the abstract, he wants us to have a knowledge of God as our creator, and thus he is a foil over against that. He talks about idolatry, which then subverts true knowledge of God. And he likens that people are like raving madmen who (laughs) turn to some use of idols and images and the like in order to function as books for the uneducated and the like. No, why don't we just let God speak to us from his word? Let his holiness, his majesty, and might be unexplained without trying to be captured by symbolic images or something of that nature. And in exploring this, he... uh, also takes us down a a short path in how the rise and misuse of images emerged in the history of the church. But just to get a taste of what Calvin says in this connection, he asks, what purpose did it serve for so many crosses of wood, stone, silver, gold to be erected here and there in churches if this fact had been duly and faithfully taught? Well, what fact? This, that Christ died on the cross to bear our curse, in short, to reconcile us to God the Father. From this one fact, they could have learned more than from a thousand crosses of wood or stone. So in his time and place, of course, kissing the cross, kneeling to the cross, all sorts of things, even the big symbol of Christian faith, the cross of Christ, had been turned to, into something that was a bit idolatrous. So Calvin is trying to point us to true knowledge of God, so we need to get rid of our superstition toward uh, sculpted images and uh, making uh, crosses a thing of veneration and things to bow before. He, and part of his point there is, look, our eyes are, aren't capable of capturing God's majesty. Calvin will go on to make clear he's not against art as such, uh, that art as such is fine, but it's certainly out of place and altogether out of place when it comes into a place of worship and uh, functions as something to be venerated. 
In Calvin's words, neither God nor people really are so easily hoodwinked. In chapter 12, he then takes us to how God is to be distinguished from idols, that how he's to be distinguished, that perfect honor may be given to him alone. So rather than transfer anything of God's honor and majesty to uh, some sort of image or idol of our making or even a cross that we venerate, um, he t- he's very concerned to rid ourselves of this problem of idolatry and to know God as he's revealed himself. And part of that revelation is you're not to make images of God. You're not to bow before them or worship them. And even if you're doing it with good intentions, um, it, it doesn't work because you're still violating the explicit command, nor does it work to use what was popular among the Roman Catholic uh, teaching of the time, still is, I suppose, where they introduced a distinction between honoring and serving or servitude so that honor is reserved to God, but a kind of uh, servitude, a serving of saints and angels and the like is distinguished from that. He says it makes little sense that God is honored, but then we're kind of enslaved to something lesser than God. That doesn't make, uh, that doesn't lead the Christian in a healthy understanding of his relationship with God or things like departed, uh, people like departed saints and angels. So once again, God's honor is profaned in this way. We're trying to be wiser in God, in short. Let's just stick to the scripture, follow God in his word, trust that it's wise enough, good enough, and indeed apt, fitting for us. So in these chapters 10 through 12, uh, we see a common concern that we gain a true knowledge of God, and we know him as the true God against idols. We know him as the God who uh, has revealed himself precisely not to be, you were not to seek to capture him by idols and things of that nature. Next, what Calvin does is uh, take us to the doctrine of creation. And uh, there's a lot that's going on with that. And Calvin tells us that Scripture teaches us to know God through his works. Uh, We don't know God by speculating abstractly about his being or by going to philosophers and their musings and speculations, but principally we go to Scripture, and what we discover there is God in his activity, in his doing, in his works, and we know God in that way as infinite and spiritual. He's an infinite spiritual essence. And this calls us away from popular misconceptions of God. And in fact, Scripture reveals that God is infinite, and his infinity warns us against attempts to enclose him within the confines of our own senses. Uh, And so he's getting at God's incomprehensibility at this point. Uh, Chapter 13 in Scripture, from the creation onward, we are taught one essence of God, which contains three persons. So he's going to take up the doctrine of the Trinity. But before we get to the doctrine of the Trinity, we learn that because he's a doctrine of creation. We'll talk about that later, but this this fact that God is the creator is how we come to know him. God and his action and the way he reveals himself is the way we can come to grasp him. But grasp, but not comprehend fully. We can't encapsulate God within our intellect and, and kind of have him on our rope. And we have him all figured out. But We do know God because of the way he has revealed himself to us. And Calvin is also, it's not only his action, it's his words surrounding his actions, of course. And Calvin's very explicit that God has to accommodate himself when he uses our language, our syntax, our 
our way and manner of thinking and speaking, he, he stoops down and lisps, if it were, in speaking to us, a kind of divine baby talk fitted for our capacity. Well, part of what comes manifest as God is the creator, the providential Lord of history, the redeemer, the savior in Jesus Christ, is we learn that God is also triune. And the doctrine of the Trinity, of course, has been a matter of great speculation at times, uh, serious error at times, and a very difficult doctrine for the church to come to clear definition about, but finally did. Uh, Calvin himself uh, believes that technical terms were the needed ingredient to expose error, to show up error, and at the same time uh, exhibit biblical truth. So he makes clear in his own words and speaking, the essence of God is simple and undivided, and he contains, that is, God contains all in, in himself without portion or uh, derivation, but in integral perfection. So that's God, that's, that's kind of as close as you're going to get of a technical definition from Calvin about God, but he's going to also define him in his trinity as a triune God, and thus the Father is, a, is distinct in his proper nature from the Son, but he expresses himself wholly in the Son. Uh, the Father is made his hypostasis, his, his person, we use that technical word there, visible in his Son. Similarly, the Holy Spirit is other than the Father and the Son, but this doesn't mean the Father, Son, and Spirit are distinct in essence, whether they are distinct in subsistence or their personhood, their hypostasis, three hypostases, one divine essence. You go, ooh, boy, that is technical, and uh, does it have to be that hard? Well, if you're to reflect Scripture, perhaps it does. Uh, three are spoken of in Scripture, each of which is entirely God, yet there are not more than one God. There's not three gods, there's only one God. One divine essence, the more technical word, usia, there, in three persons, more technical term, hypostases, subsistences, each distinct from the other, but not divided from one another, not three things, one God, but three ways of uh, being uh, the one God uh, at the same time. So Calvin embraces the, the classic Christian tradition. He opposes the errors of Sibelius, the, the modalistic error, the error of Arius and others who make Jesus something less than God. And he hangs out for a little while on the word person, uh, that God is three subsistences. He's, there's three existences in God, but they subsist as the one God. There, there's a existing alongside, distinct from, but not divided from the other. And the doctrine of the Trinity is perhaps something that average Christians find uh, difficult to fully grasp. That's true. But if you follow the Scripture, there's many biblical texts, and Calvin lays these out, and it takes us beyond uh, the scope of uh, these short talks to explore all that. But he does expose and exposit the Scripture that depicts the divinity of Jesus Christ, the Son, and the divinity of the Holy Spirit, and the personhood of the Holy Spirit. And he also exposes how there is an I-thou-ness, there is a one-anotherness. It's not, not God just talking to himself, playing a role, but there's an other. And yet, not split off, separate from, independent of, but one divine triune God. He also explores for us what distinguishes the persons of the Trinity, 
is their unique peculiar characteristics. And Calvin's fairly Western, if I may put that, versus Eastern in its in his definition of the Trinity. And that is only to say that the Father is not the Son or the Holy Spirit. The Son is not the Father or the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father or the Son. And they have their peculiar characteristics that distinguish them from one another. And um, he expresses it rather this way. Uh, each has a special mark whereby he's distinguished from the other three subsistences. Each has a special quality, which is also a relationship. So if you're comparing the Father and the Son, you see the distinction. And the Son with the Spirit, the distinctions manifest, and so the Spirit with the other two persons. Calvin would bid us, and his whole point here is that all of this is finally to know God. And you know God in his attributes, you know God in his actions, you know God finally, definitively, as the triune God who saves us, who comes to our rescue, who acts as the three persons of the one Godhead to bring us to a knowledge of himself. Next time on MarsCast, Dr. Beach moves to Calvin's writings on God as the creator of all things, highlighting his goodness revealed in creation and the divine image in mankind. If you enjoyed this episode of MarsCast, please consider subscribing and telling others who might be interested. Your support helps us to produce engaging content and to build a thoughtful community of lifelong learners and practitioners. You can find us at midamerica.edu slash podcast. I'm Jared Luchibor signing off for now. See you in the next episode of MarsCast.